Um, I, what I would like to do is, is um, expand a bit upon uh, some of the previous discussions we've had relative to uh, water competence. And uh, co water uh, competence itself uh, is, uh, in the context that I'm using it, is, is a dynamic, emergent, and probabilistic capacity. So I'll wait for Christine to make sure she has that all written down. No. Um, it, it, each of those terms are, are used in a very specific um, fashion and as part of this definition. Um, dynamic is uh, in, from the sense that they're um, it easily uh, changed and interactive. Uh, emergent means that it's not a, a, uh, a determined uh, factor but it is, it's part of the, uh, the general um, physical rules, physical properties. And then probabilistic means that um, it is, um, abides by the laws of, of chance and statistics. Um, so it, it, again, it gives, it's a little bit m less um, deterministic than sometimes we uh, have, have portrayed uh, the acquisition of, of skills. Um, it's dynamic, emergent, and probabilistic because um, it's about um, the interaction, as, as uh, Brendan just said, uh, be, of a person with a specific task and, and, and demands of that task and in the specific environment. And so uh, part of the, uh, the problem is that then it, it defies an easy um, resolution as we've typically done in our Learn to Swim programs. Uh, in, in one sense, competence could be compared to the concepts of literacy or, or fluency as they're used in, uh, in language. Uh, so water competence, I, I'd like to suggest as a dynamic, but it's also a perceived competence, a probable capability uh, associated with performing certain tasks in aquatic environments. Uh, one of the reasons I liked uh, Mike's notion of a, of a passport and then the visa and, uh, and, specific, and tying it to specific uh, 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 tasks like floating for a minute or two minute is that's very much in line with uh, the notion of what we think water competence is about. Um, in, in essence, a person will have a profile of interactions with different tasks in different water uh, environments. And this is gonna be a, a continuous process of trying to identify exactly how those go because we, we're pretty sure that there's not uh, a, a very easy transference from one uh, environment to another, also from one uh, task to another. A number of people have, have described this. Uh, the interactions I'm talking about have been described in the literature as constraints, not to be uh, confused with restraints. Uh, constraints are uh, a, a relationship that is, is established uh, between a person and the tasks they're working on and the environment. So um, I'd like to su suggest just historically the, the term water competence has been used, um, has, has really had two kind of conceptions. Um, initially when uh, it was proposed, uh, and, and I'd like to take credit for it, even though I'm the copyright holder, but it was actually proposed by a couple of developmental editors. Um, and, and we were using it as uh, a a way of describing a broad set of all-around um, aquatic skills that we felt everyone should, uh, um, should aspire to acquire. Um, we were using them as a synonym for watermanship, but trying to use it in more of a, an inclusive uh, manner. Our, our current way of thinking about um, water competence is, uh, is to look 
at it as a range or a continuum of um, these probabilities from very minimal levels of, of competence or proficiency uh, to uh, more advanced levels. So it's, it's in, in fact a developmental proposition. It changes uh, with time experience across the lifespan. Uh, we've, uh, you've already heard uh, presented on Monday uh, a set of, of, of uh, what I'll call elements related to um, uh, water competence, and I'm going to uh, critique those in a moment. Um, I would like to suggest that um, way back in 1977, even though she didn't call them this, uh, Louise Priest proposed in her Adapted Aquatics book a, sent, a set of, of, uh, uh, of core elements that she felt uh, everyone needed to be able to acquire. In particular, she was working with uh, persons with disabilities or, or handicaps. And so she proposed that people should uh, back float, front float, uh, be able to turn over, change their direction, as well as uh, what she called uh, rhythmic breathing. And I find that uh, interesting. I, I reflect back on that a uh, number of times because I think this is, uh, these tasks are a measurable way to start to get at some of what uh, I think are probably the, the, uh, the core competencies uh, that um, uh, we should be reflecting on. So um, I'd like to suggest from a physical um, perspective uh, or motoric, uh, as well as a perceived element, competence, um, we need uh, to be able to control our breathing in, or in and around or under the water. Um, we need to be able to maintain our, um, our buoyancy, I would suggest, in a variety of positions, both the front, the back, as well as perhaps the side. Um, we have to change our body orientation, and that is our again, uh, change position, but as well as, as direction in the water. We need to be able to change our location in and under the water, what we might call aquatic locomotion, propulsion. Uh, and obviously, we need to be able to um, get in and get out of the water. I, I, I think that those are the five most important and core motoric elements to water competence. They're not the only elements, but um, I, I believe those are at the essence of what we need to look at. Um, you'll notice I've tried to avoid one thing here, and that is to specify a, a particular task or, or skill. So I haven't said holding your breath for 10 seconds or floating for X number of seconds in, in a particular position. Uh, because again, I think the, the competencies should be a, uh, a construct. And then what we need to do is operationalize those and say in a particular position or a particular situation, um, th this amount of, uh, of time should be able to uh, pass while we are floating or while we are uh, traversing uh, a particular area. So um, again, this comes from that definition of, of competence as a probabilistic kind of capability that we have. Um, the model uh, is, uh, comes from this, this uh, dynamic model that uh, Carl Newell presented, and it, we're, we try to emphasize the fact that uh, even though we all kind of think, I know, if, you know previously in presentations I've asked people to say, okay, who, who in here can swim? And if I ask you to demonstrate swimming right here, you, you can't do it. Because swimming is a particular skill that requires a particular environment, that this isn't the environment. We have to go out and go across to the, uh, uh, the leisure center to do that. Um, so it, in a dynamical sense, it 
is a set of relationships, again, the, the constraints notion, that um, Newell decided was best represented by this, uh, this uh, triangle or pyramid of a person and a task and an environment. And so in his dynamic systems model, um, he suggested that um, we have personal characteristics, and, and I'm going to specify those in a bit, uh, the task demands that we have and the environmental conditions. And it's the interactions of those that lead to uh, various states of water competence. All it requires is for the person to change some capability to uh, sustain an injury or the task to change or the environment to change and our water competence changes. And so uh, we think of these, these uh, constraints as the interactions between the person and the environment, the interaction of the person and the task. And so we will we'll call those person task constraints, person um, environment constraints. So I, I realize this is a little bit small here, but I'd like to suggest that the characteristics of an individual swimmer may have to do with their body mass or the proportion of their limb segments or whether they have a particular limb or not, uh, their body comp, uh, the fitness level, their, their immediate current fitness level, not something they've had in the past perhaps, um, and certainly the state of their neuromuscular systems. Also could include things like um, their, their knowledge uh, capabilities. And then the task factors um, uh, include what's the specific goal? What are we trying to accomplish with the task? Any kind of small equipment, whether we have some sort of flotation devices. Uh, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, Newell actually uses uh, the example of swimming um, to uh, identify this other uh, task factor, which is that, for example, in, in swimming competition, we're, there are set, uh, certain rules, regulations that differentiate the breaststroke from uh, a freestyle event, for example, and those are, are built in. And then the aquatic uh, environment conditions, the water and air condition, uh, temperature, especially depth, the type of facility, and all manner of water uh, conditions, waves, um, uh, surf, uh, uh, currents, and all of this leads to a, a state of water competence, but also the person task constraint, the person environment constraints are what um, are dynamic about the model and what shift depending upon the individual person and the environment in which they are um, uh, engaged in. So these are um, the proposed elements that um, Kevin and, and Bob presented on Monday, uh, coming from a, a paper that a group of us are working on. And you'll notice the safe water entry, uh, the safe water exit competence, breath control, stationary surface competence, body orientation, um, and uh, I initially had, had not considered um, both surface locomotion and underwater locomotion, um, but, but they definitely are two different elements of, of uh, competence. And then um, as I've been, over the last several days in, in uh, contemplating the, the list, what I realized is that uh, part of, of the, for example, number eight and number nine are really person task constraints that have been identified. They're not, they're not literally competencies themselves, but they are the result of interactions, the use of the, of the PFD, uh, the wearing of clothing or not. And then, of course, there are several um, knowledge of local um, hazards, uh, 
open water, um, the ability to cope with a risk, um, the ability to recognize um, a, a drowning person are actually person environment interactions. So we're going to have to figure out how do we put forth those um, ideas um, without making it more complicated because if we tried to do every single person task or person environment, it, it suddenly becomes way too uh, complicated a, uh, uh, a description. So um, again, I'd like to emphasize the notion that this water competence is an emergent property that results from experience um, and from a variety of, of the, the tasks and environments. Uh, I think it's we think it's related, obviously, to drowning prevention. I'd uh, it rejects the notion of uh, that skill is either something you're born with or something that has to be taught, um, which is really considered a static possession of a person. It's, it's something that the, the person interacts with, but it, it's not something we possess in every uh, condition. And that's, um, again, going back to Michael's presentation, uh, it reinforces the notion that you may have a certain competence in a, in a pool environment, um, especially a shallow water pool, and that competence doesn't transfer when you are um, in a, uh, a different aquatic environment. So these emergent probabilities are things that are going to be um, the source of a, a number of, of uh, research studies that we need to uh, play with. I, I also like to, and I, I've put forth this question before, I'm wondering if, if, if swimming is a, um, a result of a, um, an emergent set of, of what we would call enabling constraints, uh, perhaps drowning is uh, the emergent failure of competence. That it's um, uh, so we talk about constraints as either enabling, that is um, improving uh, the ability to perform, uh, or disabling, which is, is, goes in more of a negative direction. So the under, we understand that fitness, experience, body types of people will interact differently in the aquatic ta uh, tasks and environments. And I'm wondering if that in particular uh, uh, as um, uh, John Leach uh, presented the other day, maybe we need to stand the idea of competencies on their head uh, and, and look at both the enabling capability of, uh, of looking at competence as well as the, the disabling. Um, I would like to propose that focusing on water competence has, um, has a vast implications for what we, we think we should teach and, uh, and or have uh, uh, students practice and how we, how we teach it. Uh, I'm going to just pop over the last two of those. And, and I would like to suggest that um, competence is not just in the performers, in the students, but in fact, it's, it's um, competencies are things that are associated with those of us who are in a, uh, a leadership or uh, instructional role. Uh, we've proposed that uh, developmentally appropriate aquatic practices um, for aquatic clinicians is that they have to be able to assess uh, uh, the aquatic readiness and, and water competence in a developmental fashion. Um, they need to know how to do this, taking into consideration individual differences, and particularly in understanding that um, we need to be able to manipulate the tasks to make them either easier or harder, depending upon the demonstrated uh, proficiency of, a, of the individual in a particular, um, in a particular situation. The, um, 
making tasks harder or easier is something that's associated with developmental task analysis. I'm going to show you a table here um, that is, is one that I propose uh, one way as a schematic to think about how do we really investigate what happens with water depth, what happens with uh, varying the distance that someone has to, to swim, the uh, way that you get breath control, whether you're wearing clothing or not. Um, this, uh, if you think about the, uh, the little uh, table here, you've got um, five to the third power number of, of different situations that you can, uh, you can actually practice. And so, in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to um, try to reiterate that water competence is, uh, is much different than just focusing on teaching swimming strokes. Uh, it's, a, it's a probabilistic um, capability. Um, we, we have to think about competence not from a right or wrong perspective. We need to focus on the whole assessment, the validity and reliability of assessment. And uh, some of the takeaways from this is that it will influence the way our, our aquatic curricula. Um, it will, needs to have a shift away from thinking about that there's a right and a wrong way to perform skills, uh, right and wrong in a judgmental uh, fashion, uh, uh, subjective fashion, and that we need to think more probabilistic and that, for example, developmentally appropriate practices will be very uh, helpful. And finally, I'd like to conclude with a, a, what I'll call a shameless commercial. Um, if you look in the, in the program that you got from the conference, there is an advertisement. Um, I just want to say out loud, make sure everybody is aware, the um, International Journal of Aquatic Research and Education has, um, has really shifted. Uh, for, nine, for nine years, it's been a proprietary subscription-based print and electronic journal that Human Kinetics um, uh, published. Um, and it's focused on, particularly on non-competitive aquatics, so it includes water safety, drowning prevention, a whole host of, of topics. Um, so Human Kinetics decided that they could no longer afford to publish the journal, so we've shifted to an open access, electronic only serial. Um, unlike many other uh, open access journals, there is absolutely no cost to authors or readers. Okay? So there's no subscription like the journal used to have. Um, and uh, at at dinner last night, you said, and what's your economic model? And I said, socialism, <laughs> Trump, Trump socialism, because uh, uh, actually our university buys this uh, ScholarWorks um, uh, product, and uh, it, it will replace both the published website by Human Kinetics as well as the Manuscript Central, so it's a one-size-fits-all. You submit to that, that URL, um, we review the manuscripts, and um, you can access all of the old, the nine previous volumes, as well as all the future articles uh, at this. So I encourage people to, um, uh, to check it out. Uh, the, we think the out, we are uh, dedicated to being, continuing to be peer reviewed scholarly publication, but um, and with original research or educational articles, uh, we encourage uh, letters to the editor. Um, and uh, you can do so without uh, putting it, making a, a user account. But if you uh, would like to be an author or a reviewer, uh, if you make a reviewer, uh, make a user account, that uh, there are directions on the website for that, and encourage you to do that. Uh, but uh, as of right now, you can log on this very minute and find every article that's been published in the journal the past nine years, absolutely for free. 
So uh, we, w the uh, librarians who are in charge of scholar works are certain that our, our citation rate is gonna go up dramatically. So for those of you who are authors or who would aspire to be authors, I um, certainly encourage you to do that.